Hey guys, we are back. It's been a while since I last released the video, and for that I do apologise. We've had some personal things going on in the last few months, which meant that this has been rather manic. You're going to see a little bit of a shift up, but we can discuss that at a later stage, or I can just put it as different content in its own thing. We're going to get into this video. It's going to be the Affliction Warlock Guide, because 0.7 patch has been... A turbulent time for Affliction Warlocks, so we're going to get into the talent changes, we're going to talk about the specs, our options, and kind of where the spec feels, and what that means for Warlocks going into the point one patch, and where I think things are going to go. So, without any further delay, let's get into the talents. Right, so, starting with the talents then. We're going to do both the class tree and the spec tree in this. So that means that for this video at least, the talent section is going to be much more in depth than it will be for destruction or demonology because I will be referring back to this video. So please do bookmark this if you plan on playing the other specs because I'll be referring back to this at key moments. So the class tree itself had a few changes, the key ones being the introduction of Socrates, Guile and Sargeri Technique. These are both two, two rank talents, which sinks four points in... Um, into damage dealing abilities or damage related talents that we otherwise previously had to play around with for other things. So what this means from a damage perspective, also Demonic Inspiration and Wrathful Minion have just flat changed rather than them being proc based um, increased damage, they now just flat increase the damage done by the pet. We do have a new choice node here of a choice between Nightmare, when fear ends your target is slowed, or Horrify, which allows them to basically tremble in place. This does mean that you can get some use out of Howl of Terror, turn it into a 40 second blinding light, essentially. The only drawback to this is you need to be in the Grundle, or you need to be like right up with the tank in order to make full use of this, to be able to AoE... Um, or to interact with things at AoE range. Something like Spiteful would be a really good example of using this, if you were willing to sit in the Grundle with the melee, where things can get very, very manic, and very, very chaotic. But as Affliction Warlocks, we don't get punished as much for movement, because once we get our dots rolling, and we are a dot-centric class now, we can afford to move around a bit. We're not necessarily as um, turret-like as we once were. But I personally prefer playing with Mortal Coil because it links up perfectly with Dark Pact and gives us a 45 second way to utilize our health in a fashion that gives us a huge amount of shield and defensive. Because you can Dark Pact straight into a Mortal Coil and you return the health you've just sacrificed. Because remember, they're both 20%. Uh, you sacrifice 20% of your current health, you heal for 20% of your maximum health. So if you're full health going into an event, um, say first boss of uh, Shadow and Burial Ground for instance, you can Dark Pact to preempt the damage window and then Mortal Coil because you know that it'll top you back up and you'll have this huge beast shield afterwards. I personally really like how that lines up. Now you can see that we need to open up this right hand side of the class tree and the way I do that is Demonic Gateway into Shadow Fury, which allows us to drop down into picking both Socrates Guile, which for the case of Affliction, improves our Agony damage by 8 or 15%. And then you have Sargeri Technique, where Shadow Bolt and Drain Soul damage is increased by 8 and 15 respectively as well. Now, this is really nice. Passively helps our damage, gives us a bit more throughput and scales well with AoE in the term of Socrates Guile, and Sargeri Technique is a single target thing. Now, the problem with this is, as you can see, we have one point to go into the next tier, and we don't have Fell Domination, Burning Rush, we don't have Banish, we don't have Camplify Curse, we don't have any of these utility abilities that we had previously. Now, out of this particular at this particular stage, Burning Rush. We want the movement speed increase. Although we will be picking up Fell Domination shortly, I'll be talking you through kind of the choices you've got, because this is kind of like your bare bones. We'll then talk, discuss your flex choices, as it were, afterwards. Pick up Soul Link, 
because that opens up Synergy and Conduit, which is another four points that we've got to sink into this, which always feels really bad. But we then, personally, I then pick up Soulburn, because the utility that Soulburn provides for a Soul Shard is really nice, especially with things like Gateway, Drain Life, Health Funnels, Health Stones, and being able to just like pick yourself up a lot. Granted, you don't always need this, because from a pure damage perspective, you'd either be taking Summon Soul Keeper, which is an AoE cast ability. It has been tweaked a bit, but it keeps getting buffed and nerfed to the point where the stable choice is Inquisitor's Gaze. Just keep Inquisitor's Gaze and you're happy. Now, these are the five points that we basically have to play with. Generally, it personally comes down to four, because as I say, I default to Soul Burn all the time. And then... You're really down to three. You, I would say you're down to three because Fell Domination is a three-minute cooldown ability baseline, which needs to be shorter, really, and we can't warrant spending two points in Fell Pact in order to make this less. But not having it, if your pet dies for whatever reason, or you need to quick swap, say a Temple of the Jade Serpent, if you're playing Affliction or Destruction, you can utilize your pet utility to help the group. Uh, Imp Dispel with the um going the start of the second boss room when you've got the two pandas and they're throwing uh, debuffs out your imp can cleanse them so if you coordinate with a healer on a fortified week you can massively reduce the amount of healing output that the healer needs to do and your imp can also do the same with the touch of nothingness on the last boss of shah but having fell domination allows you to quick swap your pets as and when because you're still going to need kicks at times. So once you've dealt with those two pandas, you fell domination, summon your fell hunter, continue the group as normal. And then during the RP element, um, once you've defeated the last pack and your healer's getting mana, because we all know that last pack is a bitch, you can then fell domination again to resummon your imp, which is, it's nice. If you want to hard cast, you can, but personally, I stick with Fell Domination. If you're going to sacrifice a point, sacrifice Soulburn for these additional points if you need to. Now, Soulburn, generally I end up sitting with another like Strength of Will to make Unending Resolve even stronger, which drops us down to two points that we have to play with. You can, as I say, you can move these these particular these last five points around based on what you need. So Amplify Curse really really strong um spell especially when you have key casters that need kicking a lot because remember this turns your curse of tongues to like a 70 percent cast reduction it makes it really easy for a single melee dps to juggle certain kicks like flash fire for instance is a really good example in ruby life pools an amplified curse curse of tongues allows a shaman, if they kick the end of each cast, to cover flash fire on their own. Two melee can juggle it safely, but Amplify Curse kind of gives the group a bit more breathing room, especially if you're going for larger poles. But my kind of go-to strength of will, fell domination, soul burn, that leaves me two points to kind of play with what I need. And generally speaking, I'll sit one point in grit, Fell Synergy. This allows Soul Leech to heal me, giving me a little bit of passive leech, essentially. Um, and also giving us a 50% of the absorption for the pet as well. Which then leaves us a singular point to put wherever we like. Sometimes this goes in Profane Bargain or Resolute Barrier if I need it back, but 9 times out of 10 it just kind of hits itself in Phoenix Stride just to give me that little bit of faster movement. So that's kind of my view of the class tree. Now let's move on to the spec tree. So on to the spec related class tree. Now we're going to do this in two parts. We're going to do the single target side of things, and then we're going to do the AOE side. But affliction, affliction got choices. <laughs> And we'll get more to that when we have AoE. But for the time being, let's kind of break it down. So, Xavian Teachings is now baseline. That was Corruption is now Instant Cast. And has now been replaced by Rather than Agony. Rather than Agony is now one point rather than two. 
which kind of makes it a instant pick because of agony ramping up to 18 stacks more damage paired with Socrathar's guile even more damage now which is lovely pick up nightfall shadows and brace this part hasn't changed but dark virtuity uh I'm not even going to attempt it to pronounce that correctly. This talent here, Shadow Bolt and Drain Soul deal an additional 5 or 10% damage. And then you've also got Kindred Malice as well, which we are going to want to pick up to open things up. So that's Malefic Rapture and Seed of Corruption deal an additional 8% damage or 4, 8. Now, Drain Soul, Focus Malignancy. We're going to want Siphon Life because this is a single target. Now, Phantom Singularity vs. File Taint. This is where we start to have a few choices. Vile Tain obviously comes with a Soul Shard cost, whereas Phantom Singularity doesn't. Now, either of these two work, depends on how much you're going to play. Vile Tain, for me personally, plays better and sims a little bit higher because I can make use of it when I'm not necessarily always in my downtime. Now, going looking ahead to 10.1, slightly here, we're going to see a push back towards Phantom Singularity because the cooldown will be reduced to almost being 30 seconds with the tier set. And it will have a longevity period where it refreshes the dot, assuming that the tier set doesn't change from its current incarnation. So either Phantom Singularity or Vile Taint work here. Um, you can decide based on your own personal preferences there. What this means is we then end up looking at this situation where we have five points to spend, but we don't know where to put them. Now, we need to pick up Weathering Bolt, because Shadow Bolt and Drain Soul deal 7% increased damage, up to 21% damage per drain effect, or per dot that we have on the target. Now, Sacralash's Dark Strike isn't going to get us there. I'm not interested in that. Soul Flame only really works when you're in a cleave setting. And Inevitable Demise isn't great. The damage from Drain Life has kind of dropped off a lot, really. So that kind of leaves us with Soul Swap as an option. So we drop into Soul Swap, we pick up Withering Bolt. We now have two points to spend. Now, what you'll see a lot of the time is you'll pick up Seed of Corruption as a potential pick-me-up if there's like some elements of AoE from a raid perspective, so you at least have some way to mass apply your conflagrate, uh, not conflagrate, Jesus Christ, wrong spec, your corruption, which if you are running Vile Taint like me, that means that you have a quick two casts to mass apply both agony and corruption to everything and just let that tick over in an AoE setting, which is quite nice. But... If you're going like a pure single target, there is also the element to pick up Grimmer of Sacrifice, despite Blizzard's nerfs to Sacrifice, from a single, single target perspective, and for a single point, this is where your point goes, because it allows you to then open up your options in terms of how you want to play this bottom tier. Because there's a few options. Quite a few options, in fact. You have the traditional... Dark re dark touch, haunted soul, tormented crescendo element, pure left hand side, where you've got faster dot takes, malign um, malefic rapture, and unstable affliction, end up with this feedback loop between malefic affliction and focus malignancy. You then have dread touch that has now been buffed, so rather than it being in a six second dot that you have to maintain, it's now an eight second dot. It makes it much more manageable to play around with while playing normally um especially in single target fights like teros and things like that pure single target but also allows for some aoe elements with haunted soul meaning that haunt now increases the damage over time uh, damage over time effects on all targets by 20 percent, which is just haunt now does more damage and causes everything else to do more damage which is nice, something that we're all used to playing and then you have a single point which allows you to pick dark glare now, this build does really well single target, and its damage profile kind of sits in this like passive situation where 
you don't really have a cooldown to speak of. Your Dark Glide does come up every two minutes, but it basically comes in as a dot extension, which allows you to feed more into Dread Touch. Now, with the changes to Dread Touch, though, you could pick up Soul Rot, which means that every minute you're going to have this window of burst. So rather than being like a two minute affliction window, we end up in this minute build. Now, Vile Taint being 30 seconds, and this is why it plays better for me, is because it allows you to go 30 seconds, minute, 30 seconds, minute, 30 seconds, minute, with Dread Touch in the middle of this. Because what you've got to remember is Vile Taint not only reapplies Agony for you, but Vile Taint is also its own dot. Which means that you go into Vile Taint, you go into Soul Rot, with a Dread Touch rolling, and for the 8 seconds that you have both these applied, because Vile Taint is a 10 second cooldown, or 10 second duration dot, sorry, Soul Rot is 8 seconds, you literally tick off, you have your Dread Touch rolling already, you Vile Taint, Soul Rot, Malefic Rapture, and just let it tick. You are going to do a lot of damage. But this gives you that option. You also have, if there's some elements where there's going to be like Cleave or Crit, you can play something that looks similar to this. Now, this is where you start getting into that kind of hybrid playstyle of there's going to be some ads that we know about, but I still need some single target. And this will, for the most part, do you in some play in some cases. But then we get into the AoE elements. Now, dropping the AoE for a moment, we see a slight shift. We see drops in Dark Fortuitacy, because we just don't care, and we move those points to Soul Flame. Now, we're going to want to pick up Soul the Seeds from somewhere. So what we do is we drop Soul Swap or Sow the Seeds. So you end up in this situation, and this is what your tree looks like. You've still got Kindred Malice, so Malefic Rapture's doing more damage in single target settings. Seed of Corruption's doing more damage. We just lose a bit of Shadow Bolt or Drain Soul damage. We keep Drain Soul because it's good for Shadow Embrace, and you can still play around with things. But this is just a couple of points difference from what we were just looking at, at least down to this bottom tier. But this is where the whole can opens up for Affliction. Because what some people will recommend you play is a build that looks very similar to this. And this is going to be like your cookie cutter horned Grim Reach build that some people remember playing. You've got Soul Rot, you've got the fast dot ticks. Horned is your AoE dot increase of damage when you don't have your Dark Lair and your Dark Lair Grim Reach. Because of the Dark Lair buffs and subsequent nerfs, Dark Lair is still a really, really powerful cooldown. To use it as an example, quarter stars 21, open it up, my Grim Reach, my Dark Glare in quarter stars, bearing in mind quarter stars isn't a huge AoE heavy dungeon, like there are some good packs for AoE, but they don't live particularly long, especially when you're running with a Red Paladin and a Shadow Priest. So my Dark Glare didn't get as much value as I would in say an Algathara's Academy, but yes, I know Algathara's Academy is huge. So maybe not good offensive, or let's think, Ruby Life Pools, where you can have some really, really large pack pulls in order to speed things up. Like the first part of Ruby Life Pools, for instance, you can do in like two big pulls to the first boss, and you'd get huge, huge feedback from Grimreach for that, which is really nice. But then it does feed into another problem. So, whereas something like Quarter Stars, although you have a couple of packs that are quite large, or you can make quite large, it's not always how people play the dungeon. And that's where we then open up into changing things to this. So there is a build that I've seen that plays it this way. Now, Haunter still, even with one point in it, increases the damage dealt to the target by 10% for 18 seconds. That is a single target damage increase while you have haunt on the target which feeds into dread touch so dread touch haunt single target really nice you then have soul rot with soul eaters gluttony where unstable affliction reduces the damage of uh, the cooldown sorry of soul rot and then you have dark harvest which we used to play in shadowlands as a legendary effect 
Each target affected by Soul Rod increases your haste and critical strike by 2.5% for 8 seconds, and that stacks obviously up to 4 times. That's 10% haste and crit for 8 seconds after casting Soul Rod, which allows for some of the seed usage, dot ticks if we're dread touching, Dark Glare gets benefit from it, and we end up in this position where we can do a huge amount of damage. And the thing is, by using this particular build, we... Our Dark Glare, again, is being used primarily as dot extensions or as a single target damage increase because it has been buffed baseline. It doesn't necessarily have Malevolent Visionary where its damage is increased further for each damage over time effect active, but it still does okay. And this particular build allows you to make use of something like Court of Stars or Shadow Moon Burial Grounds, which... Outside of the spiders, you don't really have any huge moments of AoE. It's, you know, three packs, four packs, the couple of five packs in the terms of like two or three caster packs, but still allows you to pump out really good single target damage without sacrificing too much. Because you still have things like Soul Flame, which are going to massively detonate on things like those spider packs. When something small and squishy dies, it's going to pop something else, which is really nice. So, Affliction, Affliction's door's been opened up slightly in terms of the talent choices, and it really boils down to how you want to play. Unfortunately, it has meant that things like Wrath of Consumption has kind of dropped off in terms of its ability to be picked, purely due to the limiting factors of how many talent points we have. Because ideally, what we'd probably want to do is... Maybe try and play something like this if we still had dark, the option for Dark Glare. Because what this would allow is, especially in something like Knock Hood, for instance, where, generally speaking, you can pull a lot of things up until the end, you're going to get a lot of benefit from Wrath of Consumption throughout the entire dungeon, only for it to then drop off at the end. But then you have the four adds in the middle of the fight that you can get back up to five stacks, and then you could hold a five-stack Wrath of Consumption for 30 seconds with bloodlust things like that so need to do a little bit more playing around personally i might pin it in the comments below but trying to get wrath of consumption back in for increased dot damage across the board would be nice perhaps seeing a build that looks like ooh, let's have a think like this perhaps might be a good halfway house because you don't necessarily need tormented crescendo a lot of the time if you're playing with um a more aoe centric side of dread torch but that is more the speculation side of things so if you want favorite crafting we can do it for 10 one now we're back but for the time being let's get into actually seeing how this might play and then we'll discuss gearing a couple of tips and then we'll go into wrapping up the video. Don't worry, we're halfway there, guys. Right, so, single target then. Looking at the single target build, nothing should show up. Unfortunately, in this situation, Soul Swap is kind of a meh ability, like we're not going to use it. This is Soul Swap primarily is for Cleave, but again, it's one of those one-point things in order to get us withering bolt. So... We'll get our dots rolling. Now, the interesting thing that you have to bear in mind with Affliction is we're kind of going to want to build up our UA stacks to three. We're going to want to refresh it, get our up, and then get our dots rolling. So now we end up in a position where we're just now maintaining dread touch trying to make sure that we don't let it expire our dots don't expire and above all we do not let our shards cap which is sometimes a little bit harder than you'd think so let's use another and then we just don't want ua to drop and we kind of maintain our dots But you can see that we're kind of comfortably sitting now 
uh, about 70k single target and i'm not fully optimized in any way shape or form in terms of my gear and a couple of other bits and pieces that we could be playing with you know raid pieces sockets things like that now my ring my onyx annulet which we'll discuss in terms of gearing also isn't set up ideally for single target it is currently set up for aoe and mythic plus using the storm infused stone pestle and plague stone and the obscure pastel stone it allows for a bit of a feedback loop when it comes to aoe but that is the single target side of things it is purely a management play style where drain soul is very much a filler to keep shadow embrace up while at the same time ensuring that your unstable affliction never drops off and you've got three stacks for your dread touches and your other dots remain up and then it's just a management game in terms of soul shards dread touches with procs here and there now tormented crescendo for free malefic raptures is nice but you can see they got to a situation there where I actually I had to burn a lot of Malefic Raptures in order to get my shards back down to a point where I wasn't subsequently overcapping them. But all in all, it's not bad. Feels nice to play. And it does a high amount of just passive damage, which is nice. But onto the AoE then, where things get a little bit more enjoyable, in my opinion. Now, for the AoE elements, we're just going to focus on what would essentially be your default horned grim reach build with a two minute profile with soul rot and faster dot ticks kind of assisting in your damage during your downtime. what this means is you end up with kind of like a big window little window every minute with your vile tame windows kind of sitting in every 30 seconds this is a relatively smooth damage profile and the main one we're going to use because the rest of it starts further adding to like a passive or a priority target situation and i'll have to ask you guys to forgive me here because i'm going to focus more on just getting the damage out and then we can talk about it afterwards so Now, as you can see, the damage is pretty... It, it looks chaotic as you're trying to, like, spam targets. At this point, you kind of need to find a player to profile that you prefer to use just so that you can properly maintain stacks of everything that you're after. But this will also get a lot easier as you just get comfortable playing. But you can see that by utilizing Vile Touch in the right places, we can have these extended periods of agony damage while still making full use of Haunt and UA on priority targets with Siphon Life as well. Now, what you want to do is maintain agony on up to four targets as a default, like in your interim periods, which is always good to do. You then have siphon lives and we kind of just like rotate through and you can see that we're kind of comfortably sitting on this 20 120k ish mark dps and i'm not fully going like there's there, there's where we could optimize this in more ways than one now by doing this dark light comes back up and again, we end up in this position where we have just copious amounts of shards where we can throw out the damage. Our Dark Lair is going to be doing some work for us. And we kind of just comfortably sit now. And again, let our Dark Lair take over. Now, again, 
as I previously said, my ring is kind of set up more for these AoE moments with a lot of the procs feedbacking into themselves, both through my feather and through the ring procs themselves, causing AoE splash damage and cleave and things like that. So if we just show the damage, you have my storm-infused stone doing comparable damage to soul rot. You've then got my pestilence stone doing comparable damage to siphon life with Amos of the Blue and my additional stone causing procs like humming, freezing. Um, we have two pestilent plague dots present because our obscure um, obscure stone just randomly causes procs as the tooltip states. So spells and abilities have a chance to cast a random primordial stone effect, which is nice. But what that does mean is that we just have random moments of these higher damaging abilities, but you can see that the primary damage breakdown for that, in terms of our stone, and the one that we really want for AoE, is this storm-infused stone. They kind of had these rocks of damage throughout the course with 45 hits and it's nature damage not great you could make full use of the fire one if you wanted to further try and proc the use of um root keepers blaze because we only got three hits there and it's fire damage that it needs so, or sorry a random chance to proc fire damage i'm thinking of um brood keepers ring i do apologize but so, yeah, you, you end up in this situation where you can feed off it, and you could apply the fire damage stones. You've got the entropic stone, and you've got... Where is it? Oh, I don't actually have that stone. But there's a stone that does fire damage, and then you can increase the damage it deals... Um, and turn it into chaos damage, which then assists in further procking Donia's chosen seal. But anyway, that kind of covers the rotation elements of it. Now let's actually get into the gear mainstay itself. So, moving location slightly and discussing gear. For those of you that have watched my previous guides, you'll know that crafting gear is kind of the main debate. With tier sets being a thing, and you wanted to fill out your tier slots, rings, trinkets, weapons, and then the crafted gear element of it, especially as a clothy, we have a few choices. Now, for those of you that have watched my previous guides and remember them, we had a choice. Now, the general convention that a lot of people have probably pushed their way towards is a mix of elemental lariat, which is a jewel crafting neck piece, neck piece that I'm sure everyone's familiar with at this point, and Amis of the Blue. It does take up a tear slot, which means that obviously the rest of your slot pieces are then taken, but Amis of the Blue causes your damaging spells and abilities to trigger a burst of arcane energy. Does an, does an okay amount of damage. It'll contribute a fair bit of damage, over the course of a fight. So you can see that during our target dummies that we were doing a minute ago, we were looking at about 1.4% of our damage just flat being a proc based off our shoulders, which is quite nice and is kind of indicative of terms of total damage of what you'll be looking at in AoE settings for Mythic Plus. Now, for those of you that are, as I say, older members of the audience who remember watching my other videos, you'll remember I advocated the Azure Weave set rather than the Elemental Lariat. Now, the Azure Weave set take up shoulder. Again, so Amos of the Blue doesn't really impact us too much, but also takes boots in terms of its off piece. It can be robe, like chest piece as well, because you have two, you need two pieces of the set, and two of the three pieces are tear slot, so you can mix and match these, depending on what you need. Now, in terms of overall DPS difference, and I also have a 415 Wolf Strike Pendant, um, which is haste mastery, pretty nice, 
as a optional neck piece. Now, the difference between these two Oh, well, actually, first things first. For those of you that don't know, that maybe have never thought to craft this particular set of items, the Azure Weave Mantle, or the Azure Weave Set, means that your damaging or dealing damage has a chance to grant piercing, what's called Piercing Azure Weave, which is a, just a flat intellect buff for eight seconds. If you're possibly casting healing spells at all, then it reduces the mana cost of your spells for eight seconds. Now, the proc rate of this is roughly somewhere in the region of about a 45-50% to 50 proc rate, um, whether it be Mythic Plus, Fights, things like that. It has a very, very, very high uptime. And at 418, the amount of intellect it provides was close to about 400 intellect, which is quite nice. What this means in terms of an actual damage perspective is whether or not you're running at Lariat or Amis or the Azure we've set, there's only about 250-ish DPS in it um, between the two sets. That That is primarily for single target. Like, I'll show you the difference here. And this is single target affliction, running current values with my current gear. You can see that by changing my gems slightly, we end up in a position where we're just shy of 300 DPS. Now, that's not bad. Don't get me wrong, it's not optimal and it's not the best. So Lariat and Amis is in fact the best at current from a single target setting. And if we were to look at AoE, we'd see a similar discrepancy between the two. And for the sake of everything, we'll actually do this partially live. So we're going to swap talents for a moment to the AoE build. So again, defaulting to Grim Reach and Horned for this. We're then just going to sim see this. I'm partially doing this so you guys, if you don't know how to sim see, you can kind of see how this would work. So we'll go back to top gear. We'll copy and paste the add-on SimC's output, which gives us this. So you can see that we're currently wearing the Azure Weave Mantle set, so we need to select our Lariat, Amos of the Blue, and my optional boots. Now, because we're going to be looking at AoE, my Onyx Annulet becomes an option, and I'll kind of discuss where this becomes a thing in a moment, but I suspect the stat rings will still be better. We then have a choice in terms of our gems like you or i say gems trinkets you can see i have a lot of them as options i've got ruby life shells spiteful storms desperate encoders votex things like that ice blood death snare really really good for large destruction aoe pulls but we'll discuss that in its own video i only have a normal version of the whispering incarnate icon and i still have a 372 iridius fragment but that's for like a three minute build that we play um for demonology now scrolling down we're going to replace the existing gems Haste Mastery is kind of our thing at the moment. It's what stat sims the best for me. We're then going to look at this and we're going to open up this patchwork setting and we're going to look at, say, eight bosses, 40 seconds, which is kind of your expectation with things like Bloodlust, large, larger pulls. Uh, you can drop this down to five. We'll run it as a sim option, so we'll do five. We'll remove Bloodlust, Battle Shout, Courage, Power, Fortitude, Chaos Brand, and then we'll sim. So by doing it this way, you guys are able to watch how I come up with this, for those of you that don't know, new to the class, but also so you can see how I'm testing the difference between the two gear sets. Now... For the rest of our toolkit, we're primarily after things like item level. Rage Feather, Raid Trinkets, all really, really good examples of gear for this. However, the speculation when it comes to crafted gear, Blizzard have announced that they don't want Lariat to be as dominant in the next patch in 10.1. 
and we're going to get improvements to the crafting system. So crafting gear like the Azure we've set, for instance, is going to continue with us. And if it stays the way it is, not having been buffed or nerfed or anything really, I suspect it'll become the top dog, especially if Lariat is going to take a nerf because they don't want us using Lariat. And an int proc as it scales is just going to get progressively better and better. Now, interestingly, you can see that it's actually not that huge of a difference. Now, the reason I say this is because if you have a look down here, it's actually a downgrade in AoE for me to swap off my current Azure Weave set. Remember, it is um, an int proc which scales with targets, which means that Lariat and Amis in these five target settings five targets, 40 seconds, we're looking at having less DPS, 570 DPS less, swapping to Elemental Lariat. If we were to just improve our, or if we were to change our sockets, so if I was to drop my two Mastery and Hay sockets, I'd actually lose 62 DPS in this particular sim, which is doesn't surprise me really lariat and amis do, are better for single target settings due to the nature of their procs and the nature of secondary stats however you introduce more target intellect is better scaling and as i say looking at a little bit of future proofing and theory crafting for 10.1 when the next raid comes out and the next tier comes out which probably isn't going to be for about another six weeks so we've got probably looking at middle of may start of june my my advice will be we're looking probably the week of the 23rd 24th ish of may the reason for this is because any later and it starts clashing with diablo which we really don't want but yeah so a little bit of future proofing i think the year we've said is definitely going to be on everyone's radar so if you can craft it play around with it see how it feels for you but bearing in mind the limited drop rate of the sparks at current i can totally understand if you just go amos of the blue and lariat because they're what's best at the moment for 90 percent of settings so that kind of covers gear as it were but we're going to discuss the onyx annulet as its own separate entity and the reason for this is because if we actually open it up, it's an interesting little trinket. And I don't mean trinket as in competing with Ragefire. The reason for this is because it's really based on the gems you use. Now, there's so many different combinations and so many different variations for this. I'm going to leave it to much smarter minds to actually sim craft that stuff for you. But depending on the strength of your gems depends on the item level of the ring unfortunately as you can see it has no secondary stats at all it's just a stamina ring with then proc effects based on it now you can see a large amount of dps from this if you don't already have good rings however what you will find for warlock is the amulet itself is kind of bait you can play around with it yep does well and it does do damage based on you know as you can see like the storm infused stone did a million damage it kept up with soul rot as an actual thing and this is just passive damage which is really nice but then you have drop-offs with the pestilence stone and these the humming arcane stone recently got a nerf because they didn't want to be too strong in single target the freezing ice stone as well and generally, you just find that it kind of tails off. So it's very, very good if you're gearing. But you'll find that if you end up with a 415 or a 418 ring or higher through Mythic Plus or raiding, they will dominate. Like if I had a spark and it was able to craft a ring 
I would craft a 418 ring and just put um like the holding food uh embellishment on it and call it a day because the the limiting factor of having either the azure we've set or the lariat and amos of the blue is the fact that it limits you and stops you from having the mastery embellishment when you have increased mastery above a certain amount of health which is huge for warlocks it's a really strong use and what you'll see is a combination where you know you go lariat and ring and the ring will have that mastery proc on it which is just free stats but as i say it loses out to the shoulders amos of the blue because amos of the blue do do da does damage and then further loses out in larger aoe functions by azure weave mantle so the onyx amulet really cool concept and i'm hoping it's here to stay because it does pro promote that okay well so this setup with these three storm infused stone pestilent plague stone and the obscure pastel stone really really good for affliction aoe however the darius bloodstone the humming arcane stone and the prophetic twilight stone all start making a, um, a scene when you play the other specs or when you're playing single target in raids and being able to cater a ring to suit certain needs is really really nice the only problem drawback of that is in order to change these sockets you have to go back to the forbidden reach to do it all which can be time consuming and is makes it more of a commit which is why my ring is just pure aoe because i'll occasionally play around with it in mythic plus don't really do much raiding at the moment my guild is progressing mythic resgath and i am just on the bench due to previous constraints that i mentioned at the start of this video but we're back now so hopefully the raiding stuff will be sorted and we can focus on that in, in another video hopefully that wraps everything up and we've kind of covered everything that's up to date for this patch if you guys have any questions queries want answers to things please do comment below let me know what you think and rate the shit out of the video give it a like give it a subscribe hell downvote it if you don't like it just let me know why and it's good to be back and i'll see you all in the next video when we will dis discuss the other warlock specs in the meantime though hope you all have a wonderful evening take care and i'll see you all later